All right, welcome everybody. It's quite a full room. It's good to see. Uh, welcome to the policies of distributed computing. And welcome to DEF CON, of course. Um, before we begin, let's do a quick round of introductions. Uh, my name is Bert Edman. I'm one of the fellows within Luminous, which uh, basically means that I have like a firefighter job description, you know, fighting the occasional fire at customers or internally, and rescuing the uh, cat from the tree every now and then. Um, if you want to reach out to me after the presentation, feel free to do so via email, asynchronous medium, or via Twitter. And uh, this is my uh, co-presenter today. This is Willem. Try again. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Yes, fixed. Okay. All right. So, hi, my name is uh, Willem Decker. I've uh, uh, been working in software engineering for more than 15 years now, um, mainly uh, uh, building Java enterprise applications. Uh, currently, I work uh, as an architect at a, at a uh, big Dutch bank. Um, of course, uh, for me, uh, the same applies as Beth said. If you want to uh, discuss something uh, after this talk, uh, come see me. I'm here all day. So. Okay, thanks. <coughs> so you already saw the firefighting in action, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's get back to the presentation. Um, back in the days, 1994 to be precise, a guy called Peter Deutsch at Sun Microsystems wrote up the uh, seven fallacies of distributed computing. And as 1994 seems like way back for most of us, right? Peter Deutsch was probably never more right with the fallacies than today. Now, what these fallacies are about is they are about assumptions that architects and designers and developers make about networked systems, which may prove to work in some isolated setup but as soon as you put it into production and you put it under load, these assumptions will, either in the short run or in the long run, will prove to be false and will get you in all sorts of trouble, as we will discuss during this talk. A couple of years later, another of Sun Microsystems fellows named James Gosling, who we all know as the father of Java, or most of you probably know as father of Java, even added another fallacy, making it a list of eight fallacies. And here it is. Now, Sun Microsystems was a visionary company. And back in those days, they already had the vision of the network as the computer. Actually, that was one of their payoffs, right? That was how they did their marketing. And if you look at it today, I think that vision has pretty much become a reality, right? So the network today actually is the computer. We no longer call it the network, no longer call it a, a computer. We call it cloud nowadays or whatever you want to call it. But this vision has mostly become true. So that means that the assumptions and the warnings that Sun issued uh, back in the days are probably something that we should take into account today as well. So now as this is old stuff, right, and some of it applies to developing systems and some of it applies to developing infrastructure, we found it time to, you know, give it a little spin and try and translate these policies into something that means something to developers today. So, so I gave it my best shot and what I came up with was this. Oops, the network hates us, right? I mean, that's probably what it means. And then for some reason, the cloud, whatever it may be, hates us too, right? So I don't know what we've done to these two individuals, but apparently they hold an unhealthy grudge against us. Okay, so that's something that we have to work with. Now, the trouble is though, that we as developers tend to think a little bit like this, right? So we are so used to our synchronous programming models and everything just, you know, connecting together and working when you put it on, on a little test on your maybe your local machine or maybe even if you if you put a little bit of distribution in the mix, you still have the same programming model and well that 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 easy remote call that you can do or that easy local call will also be an easy remoting call, right? And we use simple protocols like HTTP nowadays, which is easy to comprehend. It's even human readable. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, let's get back to those assumptions, right? And assumptions work up till some point, and then at scale, under load, they no longer work. So this is a story about fault tolerance, right? Getting ready for this new world order of distributed systems that we have nowadays, versus it's all your fault tolerance, right? When something goes wrong. 
And yeah, let's make it clear that we want to avoid the latter. So what we're after is called resilience. And if you were at the keynote earlier today, you already heard lots of stories about resilience, slightly different perspective, but we're actually aiming for the same thing, right? We're trying to handle the unexpected and in a well, very graceful way. So the best case could be that the user will not even notice it if there's something wrong. And if it's a little worst case, right? So if it's the other way around, then we want to have at least some mechanism in place to do something that we call graceful degradation. So yeah, maybe some parts of our system will no longer function, but we know it, and we can still serve up something else, which is still good enough for most users to work with. So that's what we're after. It's called resilience. So in order to present this to you in an understandable manner, we chose to come up with a case. And we did a case because we thought that um, that's the best way to avoid mentioning customer names. That's the first one. And the other thing is we still want to talk about you know, everyday situations that we run across when we do our firefighting at different customers. So the case is called Liquid Sunshine. It's also the name of our web shop. And as you may know or may not know that Liquid Sunshine is the same as whiskey. And since we both love whiskey, it made a perfect uh, case. So we at Liquid Sunshine, we are great into selling whiskey products. We are also aiming for customer intimacy, you know, like all of the web shops do nowadays. And of course, we offer the best service around on the internet. So in order to back that, uh, those promises up, we came up with an architecture which looks something like this, right? We have a web application <laughs> and we have a database. Now, this is how most web shops start out, and same thing for Liquid Sunshine. But then, someday, our web application became a bit slow. And, you know, it's the trouble of scaling up, right? It's the worst nightmare of every startup, scaling up. So we had to find a way to deal with it. So we decided, scale up, right? So we had many instances of our web application running against the same backend database. And that worked for a while, up to some point when our application was becoming slow again. So we looked into this situation and we found it wasn't really our application causing the issues, but now it was the database, right? So we looked into our database and we found that there was a turtle trapped inside of the database. So we decided to, you know, buy a bigger and better database. I mean, this is just how it goes, right? So now we ended up with this and it was working pretty much okay. Up to some point when we woke up one morning and we decided, oh, oh my God, we've built a monolith, right? We had this oh my God moment and we thought, well, reading all this stuff which is on the internet nowadays, you know, you can no longer build silos, you can no longer build monoliths because apparently it's something really, really bad. So we needed something else. So we sat down with our development team and we decided to switch to microservices, right? Because it's what everybody does. So for all the right reasons, we switched to microservices and it took us a while, we covered a really clean design and we, well, we broke down our application into capabilities, just like you should. And then, well, we named all the capabilities, we realized them, all of them with a different technology stack, right, like you should. And then eventually we had this, this beautiful architecture, right? And, well, actually, we fell a bit in love with it. So we were happy. Yes, we were happy. <laughs> this, this happy, actually. So... Then at some point, a couple of days after we put everything live, some point during the middle of the night, my phone started to ring. And there was a little bit of trouble in paradise apparently, because users started to report strange behavior on our site, right? Eventually the site became slow and unresponsive. So, well, we started looking into this, what could be wrong? And well, there's something to tell because we are into selling whiskey, you have to know that since it's alcohol related, our users tend to get upset easily. <laughs> yes. So that's something that we should uh, deal with. And um, so we started looking into this and we found actually that we were suffering from bad response times. Okay, that could happen. So what was actually the culprit of this bad response times? So we looked at our beautiful architecture and we found that there was one service in particular who was misbehaving. And in this case, it was the special offer service. So we started examining it more closely and we found 
it wasn't so much the special offer service who was, mis who was misbehaving, but it was the service it was calling in order to get its data. So it was actually the purchase history which was causing us problems. But now we found that since one service had issues, which triggered into another service, we were now suffering from cascading failures, which is, well, kind of hard. Because as you know, cascading failures could mean that even if one tiny service goes down somewhere in your landscape, it might eventually take down your entire service landscape, which was something we were not quite happy about. So we had to find a way to, you know, figure out what the real problem actually was and then find some measures to start isolating problems for single services. So in case something like this happened again, it would not affect all the other services, but maybe just one service and then figure out something to deal with it, find the graceful degradation way. So to understand what was actually happening under the hood, let me explain it to you, to you like this. So we have our web application, which has this big pool of threads. So when a client request comes in and all is well, it will just pick one of the threads from this pool, which will start you know, serving our requests. And at some point it does a call into a dependent service, in this case, special offers. Now if all is well, it will just respond in time and then the thread will serve the answer back to the end user, which is then happy camper. Oops. Um, if the special offer service starts misbehaving though, right, the response will either take longer, which will well, end up in a mm, less than beautiful user experience, or if it doesn't respond at all, it will maybe run into a timeout after minutes, who knows? or it will just not respond at all or with errors, um, eventually making our user a little less happy when you know about the alcohol related stuff. So, Since our you know, misbehaving service is still a pretty much an isolated case, most of the other users which are also active on our website, they don't really suffer from it, right? It's one service in particular. So all of the other services are basically behaving. So it's just a very small amount of users which is actually affected. Well, that really depends on what is happening, because if special offers are just taking a long, long time to respond, eventually more and more users on our site will start hitting pages which call into special uh, offers, which will eventually result in more and more and more of our threads being taken up from the pool, which are blocked for a number uh, of time, eventually resulting in a completely saturated uh, thread pool. And now the problem will get worse, because as more users start coming in, right, a queue will start to form, leading to our site becoming less and less responsive, or maybe uh, not giving back any response at all, which is really bad for our business, right? And yeah, that's not good. So let's take a look and dive into this problem. And so Willem, can you enlighten us and uh, show us what's wrong and how we can solve it? Yeah. <coughs> So here uh, you see uh, a typical code uh, for invoking uh, a remote uh, service. Uh, we just use uh, standard Java uh, code here, uh, open a connection, uh, get an, obtain an input stream for that connection and get the data and return it to the uh, client. <coughs> so what could go possibly be wrong here? Well, actually quite a lot. Uh, we uh, could have trouble uh, getting the connection or uh, our target service might be uh, slow, uh, so uh, that uh, causes our system to stall. Uh, or perhaps uh, the network has some troubles, also resulting in uh, slow responses. Or perhaps uh, the response we are getting back from our target service is um, uh, giving us a lot of data, which takes a while to uh, transmit over the wire. So to, to illustrate these, these, these issues a little bit more, uh, we've prepared a little demo. And uh, first, uh, before I go into the demo, I will explain this uh, setup to you. I will show you a browser uh, from which I will invoke um, our uh, web uh, uh, service from the shop. And uh, that shop is running on my uh, local host. And that shop uh, service will invoke the special offer service. And that's running on a virtual machine uh, with Wiremock. Um, and to simulate uh, some of these issues, I will use um, uh, a terminal uh, to change uh, the behavior of the network or the stub itself. 
So that's what you are going to see right now. <coughs> All right, so I hope this is clear for everyone. So here I will just invoke the special offer service. It's, a, it's really not about the data, but it's just an example of what you can get back. Well, this is really fast, no problem here. <coughs> so if we uh, look at the response times. Mm, network, all right. So you can see it's 16 milliseconds. That's, that's uh, quite nice. So uh, no problem. But what uh, if I simulate a slow service? So now I will go to the terminal and uh, change some um, uh, settings on, on our step service. Increase the size a little bit. Uh, service delay, well, let's say I make it uh, three seconds. So what you uh, will see now if I make another request uh, to the offer service, which will call to the special offer service, and that has a delay of three seconds, it's simulating the slowness, then uh, what you will get is actually uh, a slow uh, response on the uh, client side. Right? So you immediately see these three seconds uh, back here. So you have to do something about it uh, uh, to, to make sure uh, that your system will not block uh, indefinitely. Now it's three seconds, but it might be even longer. Right, so this is this is the simple example, but uh, uh, let's say I remove this delay. Right now we expect that everything is normal again, as you can see that it's 10 seconds, and now I will uh, add some latency to the network and make it two seconds, for example. So if I make another request. It's not two seconds, it's actually four seconds. And why is that? Well, if you remember the code, it was uh, two ways. It was one uh, piece of code which uh, created the connection. That's one time two seconds, and the second time you're reading the data. That's another two seconds. So that adds up and you get four seconds of delay here. Right? So there's a different problem in the network resulting in different uh, delays. Um, to make it even more interesting, I will remove it uh, and I simulate uh, a large response, right? So here you can see you get a lot of data back from our offer service. It's just uh, 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 a big amount of data. And if I set back that uh, uh, latency, it's not four seconds anymore. I do a, another request. It's actually even longer. And uh, why is that? Uh, it's because of you have to get a connection. It's one time, two seconds. Then uh, you have to read data. But because it's a lot of data, uh, you have to send multiple package, uh, packages. And that uh, uh, every time a package is sent, you add uh, and you have a delay on the network. You see that uh, in your uh, in your client server. So. Basically, that is, uh, some, that these are some examples of what uh, could go wrong um, with a distributed architecture. And now we have to figure out a way how to solve that. Well, the simplest thing we could possibly do here is at least add some timeouts. Right? We have two timeouts settings, one for uh, getting the connection and one uh, for reading data. So if we implement that and we make sure we don't get large responses, then we are sort of fine, right? So um, uh, we can use the timeouts to prevent uh, blocking threads. Uh, you can set the timeouts pretty aggressive because uh, if there's nothing wrong and everything is working fine, then uh, <coughs> the timeouts uh, should not go off and, and your system should work fine. But if there's a problem, probably you want to fail fast and uh, give a client uh, some uh, alternative answer, right? You won't, don't want to wait for that. Better fast response than uh, waiting for a long time. And also important, you have to apply it to every call in your, in your chain of uh, service calls. So not only uh, between, the sh uh, between the shop and the special offers, but also um, uh, from the special offers to the purchase history. Otherwise, if you don't add um, uh, timeouts there, 
uh, it can cause the special offer service to uh, become unavailable, which also has this effect in the shop UI. So everywhere you need to apply timeouts. So we've implemented this. Uh, everything is working again. Everybody's happy. And uh, I don't see what can possibly go wrong now. OK. Well, it sounds like some good old fashioned patching, right? Yeah. So we nailed that one. Years of experience, yeah. right? Yeah, or, yeah, exactly. So we nailed that one, right? So we made management happy again, and our users were happy. So in the end, I guess developers are happy too. But they didn't really last long until we got another phone call. And this time, there appeared to be something wrong with the website. So we started looking into it. And the site was behaving strange. It was slow. But this time, I think even more slow than the other time. So what could be wrong here? We, oh yeah, I have to explain. We are selling alcohol, so our users are easily upset, right? So there, there was some screaming involved. And um, yeah, so, so we started looking into it and we found actually we were not only suffering from bad response times like last time, which we thought we had fixed, but we now also had an awful throughput. So apparently we made it worse instead of better. So let's take a look at what's, what is going wrong. So let's look at our beautiful architecture and we found, man, it's a damn special offer service again that is acting up. So what's wrong? Apparently special offers was slow, right? And it was so slow that it was actually running into a timeout. So it took its time and then, well, it wasn't responding. So yeah, we added the timeouts on, on purpose last time, right? So eventually it seems that, you know, almost every call at some point resulted in a timeout. Because of the timeout, right, it meant that we had some way to get out of this blocked situations because after a while the timeout uh, actually uh, occurred. So we had a, w a way to walk away from it. But still the timeout itself takes a little while, right, before it's there. So at some point if, you know, there's many calls to the special offer service which will all result in a timeout, they will, all of these threads will still be blocked uh, for a bit eventually causing issues. Now, for some reason, it appeared that the load on our special office service had increased because there were many, many calls into the service, which was not keeping up with the service calls, and therefore, eventually, every call resulted into a timeout. So, to make this worse, right, the throughput became less than the number of incoming requests, right, because if, you know, the service is responding slower than you were actually uh, taking into account, right? Then your throughput will eventually drop. And as more requests keep on coming in, right? Eventually the situation will go to even worse performance. So this means that, you know, at some point when all your threads are calling into the special office service and you have still new requests coming in, eventually your thread pool will be out of threads again causing a queue to form and uh, eventually making your site entirely unresponsive, right? So yeah, this was causing a problem. And actually the reason was that, you know, at some point somebody made a clever change to include the special deals section in the template of our website, right? So they moved up the code from a one or two pages to the template, which was included on every page of our site. So this resulted in many, many more calls into our special offer service. And when, well, the developer that actually did this change, you know, he did the change and he tested it on his local machine, it worked fine. It seemed like a very simple change, right? Just moving a little bit of code around. But then when you put it into production and you put some real production load on it, and we apparently ran some special offer that was causing lots of att attention, right? It broke down and it wasn't able to keep up with the load. So the throughput became less and less and less, therefore stalling all of our threads, causing both bad response times and also lower throughput. So yeah, this seems like a real problem, Willem. Do you have anything to deal with this? Yeah, we have to think of something. Uh, can I have that? Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, what's the solution for this? So we have our timeouts and they, they actually are working because, uh, uh, and, and uh, because uh, our, our our target system is, uh, is is so slow, and and all these timeouts uh, 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 are are emitted, so uh, that may and that will that, and that blocks our threads and and uh, makes our our, our own service uh, uh, result uh, in in failure. 
So timeouts is not enough here, and we need another solution. And what we want actually is, is if we have uh, a broken target surface, uh, we don't, and we know that because we get a lot of timeouts, we don't want to hit it even more, right? So, so we don't want to send requests to a broken surface. And, and that is what you uh, want to achieve here. And you can do that uh, with a resilience pattern and called a circuit breaker. So how does a circuit breaker work? Well, here an overview of our system. We have our initiating service and, and uh, uh, calling out to our target service. And in the middle, we put our circuit breaker. And uh, if you look at, at where the circuit breaker is located, that, that's in our uh, uh, own uh, UI service, in our local uh, initiating service just before it wraps around the code, uh, the special offer client that uh, targets uh, our special offer service. Right, so in a normal situation, calls just go through the circuit breaker and will invoke um, our target service, get a response back, no problem there. So, but what uh, happens if, if there are failures? Uh, our circuit breaker will detect these failures because we get exceptions, and it, they will, and it will, get, it will uh, keep track of the amount of uh, failed service calls. After uh, a set threshold, after a amount of failures, it, the circuit breaker says, well, I, uh, I think that service is broken and I won't let any more calls go through. And it goes into open state. It breaks the circuit. Um, so all subsequent requests, are just uh, a failing fast, not going to the target service, not hitting it anymore, not uh, resulting in timeout. And uh, we can just return an error or uh, some default response uh, that's up to the developer or, or perhaps the business uh, um, to choose what, uh, what the response will be there. And uh, it will go on for a while. And then the um, circuit breaker uh, will, uh, will say, well, uh, I will test if the service is up again. And then it goes into half open state. It will uh, let one uh, call go, go, on through, go through. And if the response is OK, then it will close the circuit again and going back to uh, operating as normal. If it still fails, then it stays open and it won't hit the server more than needed. OK, so how to build that? Well, perhaps you can imagine a way to, to implement that. But actually, there's a really good library available uh, which has the circuit breaker pattern built in. It's called Hystrix. Uh, it's built by uh, Netflix. And uh, basically, you create a Hystrix command, wrapping your actual code, uh, which does the uh, call to the target service. As you can see here, uh, we built the Hystrix command. Uh, it has some uh, constructor to inject uh, its dependencies our special office client here, and then you implement the run method where the actual work is being done. If you want to um, invoke um, that command, you just construct it, and uh, you uh, call the execute function on it, and that will uh, result in eventually in a call to the run method. But uh, it also applies the circuit breaker logic, so if the circuit breaker is open, then it will fail fast and uh, returns an error in this case. Okay, so our solution here is building a circuit breaker. Uh, what we can do with that is make sure uh, that we uh, don't needlessly call a broken service. And the added benefit of a circuit breaker is uh, of a circuit breaker is that uh, broken services uh, will be uh, offloaded, so they have a, ta a chance to recover. And now we've implemented this, everything is uh, is working again. I don't see what can go possibly go wrong now. Okay, well, <coughs> circuit breaker sounds like a pretty sophisticated solution to me. So it's probably way better than the patch we did. Although I want to stress that, well, we kept both the timeouts and the circuit breaker, right? So they're complementary. And so we didn't remove the timeouts, we, we yeah. kept the timeouts as well. Right, so yeah, I think we were happy again. Management was happy because problem fixed. And so developers were happy. Um, although management became a little bit, you know, hesitant after our two fuck-ups, right? So they equipped the development teams with <laughs> these kind of things. And yeah, we were a little bit reluctant at first, but there were many days that nothing happened, right? But then at some point, this thing started to buzz, right? And it's not a pretty, not a not, pre not a pretty sight seeing developers being buzzed, right? So there was something wrong. The site was slow. 
and this time it seemed to be worse. So yeah, since we're selling alcohol, our users tend to be easily upset, again. And this time we were suffering from bad response times and also from an awful throughput, again. But I mean, what happens? I mean, we, we, we implemented timeouts, we implemented circuit breakers. So what could be wrong this time? It seemed like a really sophisticated solution. Yep. Willem, you're disappointing me here. Sorry, man. So, so let's see what's actually happening. Oh no, it's, it's the special offer service again. It's acting up again. So, so what's wrong with this service? I mean, it seems so insignificant, but... So apparently, this time, special offers was slow. It was having a slow response, which is, well, something we try to anticipate, right? We had the timeouts, we had the circuit breakers. So why didn't they work? Well, apparently, it was slow, but it wasn't slow enough to cause the timeout, right? So it was just slower than normal, but not slow enough to cause the actual timeout. And since there were no timeouts coming back and there were no failures coming back, the circuit breaker was uh, thinking, well, everything's operational as normal, right? It's just working fine. So the circuit breaker didn't do anything and there was no need for timeouts as it was just still within the timeout, but just slow. So apparently there were lots of requests coming in causing eventually our special offer service to slow down again, right? But I mean, yeah, just slow, but you know, not slow enough to cause, cause any real, real trouble with timeouts or circuit breakers. So what actually happened here was as soon as you get a sudden peak load, right? The special offer service will become slower and still, because it's still being called from each and every page, right? It can cause disruptions in our services. Now, if this happens for a little bit longer, so if, you know, after a little bit of time, then eventually we'll run out of threads in our thread pool because they're all, well, blocked just for a little bit, but just long enough for all of them to be saturated, right? So as more requests keep on coming in, eventually a queue will start to form and we will uh, make more and more users unhappy, right? So apparently, Timeouts and circuit breakers, even though they seem like a really sophisticated solution, are not enough, right? And they are not enough as your response times become smaller than the timeout, still, are still smaller than, uh, than your timeout, but you get a sudden peak in a system load, right? So somehow, Willem, we need something else to deal with this special case. Yep. Can you help us out here? I will try. So uh, now, again, all our threads are blocked and making our service unavailable. Um, we have our timeouts and our circuit breaker. They aren't working because it's still fast enough, but still keeps our, our threads uh, occupied. So we need to uh, come up with a mechanism uh, to make sure that we don't get all our threads in our server blocked. Uh, and we could do that by setting uh, a maximum amount of threads we want to use to call our uh, target service. Uh, the special offer service. And this, this is a resilience pattern and it's called bulkheads. And bulkheads is not something new from software engineering. It's actually also known from uh, shipping, where a ship is partitioned into sections. And uh, when there's a hull breach, some of the sections are filled, are flooded, and as they are sealed off, uh, they are giving up to save the rest of the ship. And the same goes for the software. Uh, here we give up a portion of our of our worker threads to at least make sure that we always have some available threads to serve uh, other requests to customers. So what does this look like? Well, we have uh, our web application with our worker thread pool, and just like the circuit breaker, we put something in between uh, the requ incoming request and the code that will call our uh, target service, the special offer service in this case. Um, in this example, we have set the size of a bulkhead to three. So if you have three concurrent requests, they just go through as normal and call our special offer service. But uh, if there are more concurrent requests, they are rejected immediately because they can't call uh, the special offer service. Okay. Uh, what this results in is that we get a uh, different user experience. We get uh, a slow response, but we get offers for some customers and other customers uh, will get a fast re response, but they get no special offers uh, here. 
uh, if you want to make this work uh, correctly, you have to look at all your outgoing services and apply bulkheads everywhere. Because now every time our special offer service is failing, but could also uh, uh, be, be uh, uh, that, that other services are failing. And then still we can uh, lose all our worker threads and uh, be, have our services become unavailable. <coughs> so uh, the size of our bulkhead, how, how can we uh, determine that? Well, there's a simple uh, rule of thumb here. We take our uh, request per second um, and, and uh, multiply it by our um, uh, normal response time from our target service. So in this case, our request per second is 25, 200 milliseconds, and we get a bulk at size of, fi of five. Um, of course, we need to add a little bit of breathing room uh, to catch uh, some unexpected uh, changes in load. It would not always be uh, so, 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 so stable as, as it is uh, uh, said here. So it's at 25, 200 milliseconds, it, it could change, but we hope not to that much. Okay, so we uh, set our bulk at size to seven. What you have to do then for all your bulk at size, you have to calculate, uh, for all your bulk at you have to calculate the size and you have to add that up. Um, and then you have to compare that to the total amount of worker threads on your server. So in this case, we have a total uh, bulk at size of uh, 28. And uh, in a typical uh, server uh, configuration, like Tomcat or something, there is a, a maximum of 200 worker threads. So in this case, we have enough threads over to, to keep the server alive and serve some responses. If it's uh, coming, uh, if you're getting really close uh, to that um, uh, uh, to that maximum amount of worker threads, then uh, it, this is not going to work because you eventually will fill up all uh, your bulkheads if there's a real big problem, uh, and, and still you have all these blocking threads. Okay, so how to implement this? Well, there, there are many ways uh, how to implement uh, a bulkhead. This is just one example, and we use the Java semaphore for that. Uh, the bulkhead size is set in the constructor uh, with, a, uh, uh, for, with, three, uh, uh, with a maximum amount of three. Um, your code uh, will ask the semaphore uh, for uh, a permit. If it uh, gets one, it can execute uh, the, the target service code. So it can go to the tar uh, special offer service and get a response back. If, it's, uh, f if the bulk is, uh, is full, it can immediately uh, fall back to a default response. Um, there are other ways to implement this. So uh, with a little imagination, you can, you can say if you have a uh, a connection pool, for example, you can use that as a bulkhead, but you really have to make sure that uh, the connection pool doesn't block uh, if it's full, because otherwise you still have blocked threads in your system. Okay, now we've implemented our bulkheads. Everything is working again. I don't see what can possibly go wrong now. Okay. <laughs> well, your sound confidence. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, you know, adding up all these resilience measures, actually, I think took care of most of the problems, right? So just to make it absolutely clear here, we are still having a timeout, we are still having the circuit breakers, and now we also added the bulkheads, right? So it's a uh, accumulation of protection mechanisms, right? So we made our site more resilient. And I think we could have gone on for weeks and weeks and weeks, right? We were happy. But then, you know, at some point in time, the inevitable happened. And this guy, came into our room, right? And he didn't really seem very friendly. So we started looking into it and we found that, yeah, the site was slow again. And this time it was even worse. So, yeah, you know this real by now, right? So users weren't happy at all. So what we found was that eventually, it was not just about bad response times, but at this time, at, at this point in time, all our service calls were basically being rejected. Now this caused a bit of a worry because you know we were really happy about all the protection mechanisms and it sounded all you know really confident and we were quite confident as well. So what happened? So we were looking into it and we found that you know our site had a sudden increase in load again, which could happen because we ran a promotion or we were just you know growing, right? So scaling up. We had all the measures in place. And well, we thought they were just functioning perfectly and protecting us from this kind of behavior, but apparently not. So what happened? We found that all of our bulkheads were full 
of blocked threads, right? So all of them were now full of blocked threads. So something terrible happened to our site. And when we started looking into it, we found that somebody had upgraded our client library, which we used to call into remote services. And at this point, we thought we had the protection mechanisms in place, but apparently we lost one of them. Apparently our timeouts were gone. And since the timeouts were gone, right, we could have the blocked bulkheads because the, the threads which were allowed into the bulkheads, they were you know, able to make a call into the, into the service. But since the service was responding very, very slowly, right, and there were no timeouts set, it was still blocking up the threads. So basically, um, this was causing the problem. Now the thing is, uh, here is, you should never blindly trust your client library. And most of us, we probably do it, right? Because we just download the latest Apache HTTP client or whatever, and we use it to do our remoting calls. So for most of us, client libraries are black box. And you think, well, how hard can they be? Just do a remoting call over network, right? But apparently these client libraries, they have sophisticated protection mechanisms as well. So when you download a new update of your client library, it might be that the configuration had changed, right? So maybe we had the timeout setting in place, but you know, configuration changed, so it wasn't picking up the setting, and we didn't, and we didn't figure it out in our test. Or another thing which could have happened is that client libraries themselves are sophisticated as well, so they might have automatic retry mechanism when something fails or they may have some of the other resilience uh, patterns built in if you do not explicitly configure them, right? So the warning here is uh, know your client libraries. So Willem, can you talk a bit about how we dealt with this problem in general so that it could not happen again? Yeah. So uh, th this, this problem is, is quite different from all the other problems. Uh, the other problems were all related to our target service or something in the network. Here, this is a problem caused by uh, a failing client library, which is just in our, in our local uh, server. So w what we need to, uh, to do here is, is to think of a mechanism, how we can um, uh, free up our server threads, our request threads, uh, without um, um, and, and, and make them available again for servicing new request request and uh, dealing with this kind of failure that uh, that timeouts don't work anymore. So what you could do is uh, introduce uh, a mechanism called a thread pool handover. And uh, what that uh, means is that uh, you create a new thread pool next to your uh, request thread. Um, and if a request comes in, you immediately send it over to the, uh, to the new thread pool, and that does all the work for you. And this allows you to, if you want, free up uh, your own request threads and uh, serve other requests. So what does this look like? Uh, you have your, your server again, and there's, there's a thread pool uh, for uh, servicing our request. This is, in, in our situation, is blocked because of a failing client library. But if we move uh, that uh, code to another thread pool, uh, we can isolate it there. So in a, in a, in a good situation, uh, well, nothing new is going on here. We have just a request, request thread coming in, invoking uh, uh, a new, uh, starting a new thread, which does the work uh, with our uh, target service. Um, and, and everything is the same as it was before. Well, actually, we made it a little bit more complex. We added another ab abstraction here, and, and we have a little overhead. So if, if everything's fine, uh, nothing, uh, nothing happens here, actually. But what if there's a problem? We have the timeout, which, which don't work here anymore. And what we can do is um, make, um, the re uh, make the request to our target service in our isolated thread pool, and we let our request thread wait uh, for the result coming back, but we can uh, set a timeout on that wait. So what happens if the timeout goes off, then we can at least free our own request thread pool. Yeah. So that's what we can do with this uh, solution. It's still important uh, to keep these uh, timeouts and circuit breakers in the service, uh, in the service thread pool, because if they don't come, uh, go off in our current situation, then uh, uh, we fill up this uh, service uh, thread pool 
and, and, enough, and there are no threads available calling our special offer service anymore. But still, we have request threads free to um, uh, service other requests or other, to other services. So what's also nice about this solution is that we actually have an implicit bulkhead uh, in place. So uh, we can replace our uh, previous bulkhead implementation with a thread pool. Uh, if we set the thread pool size to a fixed number and we don't allow uh, blocking here. So if the thread pool is full, um, we need to fail fast and don't have a blocking, uh, don't need a blocking call uh, here. Uh, otherwise our request thread uh, will, will still block it and that's what we don't want. So it's sort of other implementation of a bulkhead. So revisit uh, the solution revisited. Um, this is a generic way to handle uh, timeouts, not only for a failing client library, but also if you can remember the demo, the last uh, uh, scenario where you had the la large response uh, which uh, need to make multiple uh, uh, requests, read requests uh, to, uh, to our mocked service. Uh, then we had a lot of timeouts which were adding up. This is a way uh, to make sure that we can walk away from that problem and uh, get our uh, service free and the normal timeouts in our client library won't work here. Uh, a bonus here is of course that we have an implicit uh, bulkhead. So uh, how to implement this? Yeah, we can just create a new uh, uh, thread pool with Java with an executed service. We set it to a fixed size and make sure that uh, if you submit so, uh, something to that executed service that it won't block. And we can just uh, submit the work and it will be uh, isolated in another thread. If the thread pool is full, then it will uh, throw a rejected execution exception. And uh, this is actually our bulkhead, uh, um, uh, our bulkhead mechanism. In, uh, so we can uh, fail fast and return uh, a default response, for example. If, if there are threads available, we get a future back and we can wait for the response uh, uh, to return and serve it back to the client. Uh, the important thing is here that we add a timeout on uh, the wait. So we can, have always, uh, we can always free up our uh, request thread. Also remember the Hystrix example. Uh, Hystrix also has this mechanism built in. So instead of calling an execute on the command, uh, we can just do Q and we get a future back and we can also wait for the response coming back. So here I didn't set a timeout because Hystrix also has this already built in uh, and it will timeout for you by configuration. Of course, if you don't trust Hystrix, you can still add a timeout in the, in the get function. Um, if you want a default response back, you can also implement a fallback uh, method in the Hystrix command. So uh, on any failure, you get at least a default response back. And if you want to get really fancy and you want to move away from the blocking model, you can also uh, go completely asynchronous. Uh, Hystrix has also support for that. So in, uh, instead of getting a future, you get an observable. You can subscribe to that observable and uh, you are being called when the response is coming in. So this is, this is an alternative way of implementing, but keep in mind you, have to, you will move away from the classical blocking request response model. So this, this will uh, is, is a completely different programming model which you uh, uh, need to learn. Okay, so having all these uh, resilience measurements in place, um, mind sheet seem a lot of work and it's, it's quite overwhelming if you have a lot of uh, services which you need to uh, handle and, uh, and tune and, and what are the s correct settings. So, so what's becoming increasingly important is monitoring. So uh, on a, in, a, in a normal situation, you always monitor something like CPU and memory, etc. But what you can also do is monitor your, um, uh, your integration points. And you can get a lot of interesting statistics uh, from that. And with these resilience uh, measures in place, we can also mo monitor these. So when is our uh, bulkhead uh, filled or uh, when is our circuit breaker uh, being tripped? So this is interesting uh, information which you can use uh, uh, for production monitoring, for example. And also, if you look at Hystrix, uh, they have uh, uh, this already built in, and you can build a really nice dashboard 
in your production environment, showing all kinds of statistics and information on um, on the behavior of your system. So here you see uh, the requests per second coming in, the state of the circuit breaker, the amount of errors uh, for all uh, different um, uh, service endpoints. And if you want to get really fancy, you can also use these statistics to feedback into your running system and tune and tweak uh, your, your circuit breaker or your bulkhead automatically. Yeah, and that's the really uh, added benefit of monitoring and keeping these statistics on these uh, resilience measures. All right. Now, the thing with having this monitoring in place is that in this new world order of distributed systems, uh, the truth is you will actually see failures when you start monitoring them, right? And the thing is, you should not panic when you see uh, failures. Because in a distributed system, there are so many moving parts that failure should be regarded as something normal. It happens, it happens all the time. And especially since we now have lots and lots of calls, even if you have like a chance of one in a million, right? And there's enough service calls coming in, then this chance will be met at some point. So you will see failures. I think the only time you should be scared is when you see no failures at all, because probably then something is not really working. All right, so the new normal is dealing with failures and becoming resilient. So um, uh, don't cry for human intervention if you see failures happening, right? But tune your protection mechanism, tune your bulkheads, uh, tune your circuit breakers, and make sure that you can handle stressy a situation where, where the system is being put under load. And also um, uh, be aware that you know the, your trouble will not come in even proportions, right? You will also see network hiccups you, there, there's garbage collection in, involved. So you, you see, you see you know, little differences and little uh, uh, peaks and bursts every now and then. So make sure you give them some leeway. So for example, in the tuning of your uh, circuit breakers and also uh, of your bulkheads, like give them a little bit of breathing room. So when something abnormal happens, it will not immediately go into panic mode. Right, but well, a little bit of failure is pretty much okay because we have our graceful degradation mechanisms in place. So yeah, the mantra here, like always, is measure and don't guess, right? And so apply them um, uh, uh, when you feel the need for them and then start tuning them based on your measurements and not because you think that three threads in a bulkhead is pretty much okay. Um, making a small jump here, a little bit about testing because when it comes to distributed systems, um, it's no longer a matter of just testing the functional performance of your system, right? And testing everything you know, performs as, as desired, um, which in you know, distributed systems is now moving into the way of behavior-driven development, right? So your clients dictate the uh, demand on the backend services. So you get a bit of a BDD style of testing there for the functional part. But as we have tried to show you in our case, and when it comes to the fallacies of distributed computing and the, and the, and the trouble which can, can happen on the, on the remoting level, it mostly happens on the wire, right? You get small hiccups, you have latency, you have things behaving a little bit abnormal, right? And that's where trouble starts. So for this, there's also nowadays a whole slew of things which you can add to your testing uh, toolbox. So for example, the stuff that Willem uh, showed in the first demo was uh, WireMock. WireMock is, re is really powerful to test these strange uh, uh, networking behaviors. But there's more. There's also a tool called Saboteur, which basically works on the very low level uh, network level. So you can you know, toy around with IP tables and, and, and stuff on the Linux level, for example. And you get, get some really funny packet sizes or, or, or other uh, uh, hard to debug problems on the uh, uh, network level. And then see what happens if you start messing around with your network. Um, best practice here is not to do it on your uh, uh, host system, but do it in a virtual machine because you could eventually mess up your entire, your entire TCP IP stack. So be careful with it. And then going one step further, there's things like the Simeon Army and Chaos Monkey, also tools coming out of Netflix and also others, which um, just randomly try and kill some services, um, which, well, actually is showing you how your system behaves when strange things are happening. And then, of course, there's also uh, other stuff like good old JMeter, for example, right? It's uh, been a faithful companion for years. 
It still works in order to do load testing. There's also some newer kits on the block there, like Gatling, which is Scala-based. And also the Jenkins performance plugin is really uh, helpful in doing uh, performance and load testing. And they go together with uh, the, the stuff like Wiremock and Simeon Army. Now, if you have the balls, right, uh, the, the, the big guys like Netflix and Amazon, etc., they are running their tests in production, right? Because they think if we tune it correctly, then we can just take down services in production and nothing will happen or mostly nothing because they have graceful degradation and other measures in place. So, uh, yeah, taking this to the extreme would be to run your test in production and just randomly kill some services there and see what happens. And if you have all the degradation mechanisms in place, then it should just uh, work out fine. Now, I don't recommend you going back to work tomorrow and just taking out services in production because you said that you learned that Luminous DEF CON, right? That will probably be the wrong advice, so don't take me wrong here. But hopefully you know where I'm going with this, right? So with that, as we are almost out of time, and I'm keeping you from lunch, um, I want to come back to the moral of the story here. Now, of course, we took a case in which we slowly introduced a number of problems. But I think, and, and they all came from a synchronous request response uh, background. And the reason we did this is because to most developers, the synchronous programming model is something which is really familiar, right? It's something that you're used to on a single machine, on two machines. And therefore, if you take it to the extreme, especially in distributed architectures with the cloud and with microservices, it is something that you're just stuck to, which is just the way how you tackle problems. And that's also the way you get lots of problems, as we try to show you, right? So, yes, we focused on client-side protection. Right? By, by, by wrapping the, the call from the client to the service and putting our protection mechanisms in place there, which is working fine. Eventually, you get a stable and resilient system. But there's also lots of other measures, and Willem already showed you a couple of them, uh, uh, one with the non-blocking uh, approach. Right? But as Willem already stressed, if you go the completely uh, non-blocking way, you get into a completely asynchronous programming model and as you know, like they say, there's nothing wrong with asynchronous programming models except for programmers, right? So um, getting used to a completely new programming model is also raising the complexity bar. I mean, it's not impossible. It will give you, it will give you other solutions, which will work out fine. Um, but this is just, just to stress that there is multiple ways to deal with these kind of situations, but you should uh, really uh, uh, know them. Right? So, yeah, we only had slight problems here. So imagine what could go wrong if you run this in a bigger scale with microservices at a company like Amazon or Netflix, for example. Right? And with that, we'd like to thank you for your attention. Oops, uh, slide ended. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. I think we have about 30 seconds left. But it's going to be a quick question. So if, you, if you're interested in the code examples, you can take them from GitHub. Um, and if you want to go for lunch, which I like to do, then go for lunch and you can always reach out to us later today or via Twitter or email. Thank you. <laughs>